Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to talk here about the cardiomyopathies. And uh, for your sake, I put these cardiomyopathies in order of not only how prevalent they are, um, but also in order of uh, how likely you are to be asked about these. And so we're going to start out with the most common and then finish with the least common, okay? If you haven't had the chance yet, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. You can get there by clicking the link in the description of the video or on the i button on the upper right hand corner. I very much appreciate all the contributions that I can get to help offset the cost of these videos. And I thank all those of you who have already donated. Definitely subscribe to my channel and you'll get notifications every time I put new videos up. All right, so what are cardiomyopathies? They are disease processes that affect the myocardium, okay? Pretty simple. And the myocardium, as you know, is the heart's muscle. So anything that affects the myocardium is going to affect the heart's ability either to pump or to fill because the myocardium makes up the bulk of the heart tissue. Um, the cardiomyopathies um, are uh, commonly going to lead to congestive heart failure if they're not taken care of. And again, it has to do with the fact that this impairs the heart's ability either to pump or to fill. And if they're not, if the heart's not able to do that, blood is going to get backed up, and the typical place that it's going to get backed up is in the pulmonary circulation. So. The best test to diagnose uh, a cardiomyopathy is an echocardiogram. It gives you an idea of the structure of the heart. That really gives us a good idea of what we're dealing with. So anytime you've got a patient who's short of breath, you should always consider an echo at some point. Uh, but especially when you're dealing with a young person who's short of breath, um, one of the things you need to consider is an echo. Is cardiomyopathy the most likely diagnosis in a patient, a young patient who comes in short of breath? No, uh, but it should always be considered. All right, so these are the cardiomyopathies we're going to talk about, and then I have one more actually uh, as a bonus to add on. Hypertrophic cardiomyopathy can be divided into non-obstructive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, or HOCAM. Uh, HOCAM is about 70%, and the non-obstructive is about 30%. Uh, about half of these cases is, are due to a mutation, um, so look for it to run in families. This is autosomal dominant. Uh, 25 to 30% are idiopathic, and uh, a small minority are due to other congenital or medical conditions. Uh, the hypertrophy here results in thickened walls, and the problem with that is that it reduces the volume, uh, specifically, particularly in the left ventricle. And so even though the ejection fraction is normal, you have no problem getting that blood out, there's just not a lot of it. And where is the rest of the blood that's supposed to be there? It's backed up in the left aorta, and it's, I'm sorry, left atrium, and it's backed up in the pulmonary circuit. And that's going to result in the shortness of breath and dyspnea secondary to pulmonary edema. Um, so in that sense, it's very analogous to diastolic heart failure. And the most common presenting symptom is dyspnea. Look for a patient with a history of syncope. Those are for, uh, for different reasons. The dyspnea is because of pulmonary edema. The syncope is because of a reduced cardiac output. So strongly consider this in a young person who has dyspnea and a history of syncope. The average age of presentation with HCM is 30 to 50 years, and you can bet that there's a number of patients who are even younger than that. These are the physical exam findings uh, you may find. A systolic ejection murmur and an S4 heart sound are the most commonly tested. Remember that the S4 heart sound, all that is is that, uh, is that you're pumping against a very stiff ventricle, okay? All right, these are the causes. And then uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy has the exact same clinical presentation. Uh, the only way you're gonna differentiate this is on echo. So what is the difference? Well, with hokum, you have uh, not only thickening of the muscle, of the myocardium, uh, but you also have a blockage. Uh, so blood has a hard time getting out of the left ventricle into the aorta and then peripheral circulation. Um, and so the reason that this happens is that the intraventricular septum is disproportionately affected. And so that will block blood coming out of the left ventricle and going into the aorta. 
Um, but otherwise, these are basically the same thing, um, just with that one big, and it is big, that big exception, uh, that big difference. Um, so because you have a blockage here, this is going to be worsened by anything that reduces your intravascular volume. And the reason is that more blood keeps that outflow tract open. So we got to make sure that these patients are staying hydrated. We rarely uh, put these patients on diuretics. It's dangerous. Um, and so it's very, very important for these patients to keep hydrated and maintain their preload. Now, one of the things that will stand out here is that this is one of the murmurs that actually worsens with Valsalva. And the reason it worsens is because Valsalva reduces preload. And as we know, a reduced preload makes this condition worse. So you will listen to the patient's heart and you will hear a systolic ejection murmur. And then when you have them do the Valsalva maneuver, it will become louder. And that is classic for hokum. So this is all the things that reduce the left ventricular volume, obviously things that you would want to avoid in patients with hokum. And then these are some of the things that they have in common and in contrast. So diagnosis is echo. We look for asymmetrical wall thickening. It's always worse in the left ventricle than in the right ventricle. There's some pretty nonspecific EKG findings. As you can expect, uh, you would see changes, especially in uh, the posterior and the lateral leads. So 2-3 AVF and then those lateral precordial leads, V5 and V6. Uh, asymptomatic patients, we observe and follow up. Uh, with symptomatic patients, beta blockers are the first line. Why? Slowing the heart down allows for more diastolic filling of the ventricles, um, which thus increases preload and keeps that out outflow tract open. Um, there are surgical options for this, but it's typically undertaken after maximal medical therapy. This is what you would expect to see on EKG. Okay, dilated cardiomyopathy is characterized by ventricular chamber enlargement. And so here we have enlarged chamber rather than a smaller chamber. And what we also see is thinning of the wall. And that is going to make the myocardium weaker. So what we have here is something very similar to systolic heart failure, where it's very difficult for the dilated heart to pump. And so we, in many cases, will see a reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. Not always, but in many cases. This is genetic about half of the time, and then the other half of the time it's due to underlying conditions. Something like ischemia can do it. Um, there are certain autoimmune conditions, um, lupus, RA, pretty much any autoimmune condition can come after the heart. Um, and then there are some acquired causes. So the big one to remember are the anthracycline, cytotoxic, so chemotherapy, doxorubicin, donorubicin. Um, these are, uh, are, are very cardiotoxic. Um, and so this is a mnemonic you can use. Alcoholic cardiomyopathy is a subset of dilated cardiomyopathy. So that's another thing that can cause it as well. Usually this will present with signs and symptoms of just good old heart failure. Um, and so that can be either left or right sided, but it will tend to be, it'll tend to start as left sided failure. So you can expect to get the backup in the pulmonary circuit. And you should have a high index of suspicion in any patient who develops heart failure. I mean, they don't have a history of MI or anything like that, but they do have a history of alcoholism or maybe they're postpartum uh, or maybe they're on chemo. So you got to look at the history. And then we've got our symptoms of heart failure here. Nothing different than what you would expect with, you know, regular old CHF. Uh, so here you would hear the S3 sound. Why? Because you have a decreased left ventricular ejection fraction. And so you've got more blood in the left ventricle after uh, systole. And so what that's going to mean then is as blood comes into the left ventricle, it's going to slosh up against blood that's already there. And that leads to the S3 sound, essentially. Um, now, echo will show you dilated chambers, reduced fraction. That's what we would expect. On EKG, again, it's fairly nonspecific signs here. Because the heart kind of gets stretched out a little bit, you can get some uh, some. 
uh, arrhythmias. Um, you can also see a lo low voltage QRS, but that's uh, these are pretty nonspecific. Uh, chest x-ray, you would see a cardiomegaly. You may or may not see a pulmonary edema. It just depends on how severe it is. The treatment is the same as for systolic congestive heart failure. Isn't that nice? So if you've watched my video on congestive heart failure, you should know that patients who are under 40% ejection fraction go on an ARNI, uh, and Trestos, so Cubitril, Valsartan, a beta blocker, again, to increase the amount of filling to try to increase that ejection fraction. Remember the Frank Starling curve. Uh, spironolactone or uh, another uh, aldosterone antagonist. And then an SGLT2 inhibitor. The difference here, SGLT2 inhibitor for everybody. Okay, these other three, only if you're less than 40%. Okay. Why do we use SGLT2 inhibitors? I have no idea. It's cardioprotective, but it's not just for diabetics today. Okay. Restrictive cardiomyopathy is the least common. It's only 5%. Um, it's characterized by small stiff ventricles with a progressive impairment of diastolic filling. And so because you have these stiff ventricles, that pressure is going to back up in the atria, and the atria are going to be stretched out and dilated. And that's kind of one of the things that sets this apart. Another thing that sets this apart is that this gives you prominent right-sided heart failure symptoms, whereas the others kind of start usually in the, with left ventricular uh, dysfunction. So unlike the other two, most cases of RCM are acquired, and amyloidosis is the most common cause in the U.S., so look for that in the history. All right, so this is the various causes. All right, this is not an exhaustive list. And then if you're a pathology nerd, you might like this. All right, so um, we look in the history for some kind of possible uh, underlying cause. Um, the symptoms here look for right-sided heart failure symptoms, so uh, peripheral edema, uh, jugular venous distension, ascites, and so forth, but you can also have uh, left signs as well, like uh, the pulmonary edema. Uh, for diagnosis, again here, it's echo. Uh, look for rapid diastolic filling, very small and stiff ventricles, uh, uh, atrial dilatation. Uh, EKG is pretty nonspecific. Chest x-ray is pretty nonspecific. Cardiac biopsy is the most accurate test because it will help us get an idea of the underlying cause. Do we do this frequently? No. It's often pretty easy based on history to surmise what's going on here. The treatment is palliative. Loop diuretics and spironolactone are the mainstay, but the uh, real big one here is to try to treat the underlying cause. Um, so this has some similarities to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and then there's reduced ventricular filling and thickened walls. It's similar to dilated cardiomyopathy and that you get these heart failure symptoms, and the S3 sound is often present. Some unique things is that it often starts with right heart failure symptoms, and you have these very characteristic and unique echo findings. Um, so it can be dif difficult to differentiate this from constrictive pericarditis, so you really need to look at your history. However, the best way to differentiate the two is a cardiac MRI, and um, you'll get a really good idea because uh, the pericardium will be thickened in a constrictive pericarditis. So this last one here is a little bit of a bonus for you, and um, I'm saying it's a bonus because it's really rare, and you're very unlikely to be tested on this, but it's c commonly... Um, it's commonly talked about in the media because there's another word for Takotsubo cardiomyopathy, and that is broken heart syndrome. Now, why is it called that? Because this is caused by acute stress, okay? Now, how is this patient going to present? Let me give you a vignette off the top of my head. You've got a 55-year-old woman presenting to the ER complaining of chest pain and uh, and. Um, chest pain that radiates to the back and upper arm. Uh, you run an EKG and you find ST elevation in, uh, in uh, V1 through V6. Um, so you're thinking an anterior MI. You get uh, cardiac enzymes and they come back positive. What is the diagnosis? And immediately you're probably going to be thinking MI. And yes, that is the presumptive diagnosis. However, when you go in to do stenting, for instance, you do an angiogram, what you find is that these vessels are clean. 
This is Takotsubo cardiomyopathy or broken heart syndrome. They're going to give you a classic presentation if they want you to um, go after this. Uh, but look for a presentation almost identical to a heart attack. You're going to treat them for a heart attack. Uh, but then what you find out when you do your angiogram is this unique appearance with normal vessels and this left ventricular apical ballooning. Remember that word ballooning, that commonly uh, gets thrown. Uh, echocardiogram will show hypo or akinesis of the mid-segment and especially the apex of the left ventricle. Again, you're gonna treat this as a presumed MI, but once you find out it's Takasubo, you can stop um, anticoagulants and stuff um, unless there's evidence of clots forming in the akinetic. Uh, part of the heart. Uh, ACE inhibitors are the specific management for Takasubo. 95% um, of these patients survive. Um, so although this is not a benign condition, it, it is self-limited and it goes away, unlike the other cardiomyopathies. And these are the findings you'll see on ECHO for each of these, all in one page. I would remember this one because ECHO is, um, is a more specific test. This is what you would see on EKG. This is a, a little bit more low yield. And then this is everything all on one page.